Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Power Hour. I love the Sabbath because this is the day that the Lord has made. So I will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you can do the same today and I hope that God is going to bless you today. So last week I dropped uh, a new series called Live From Victory. Did you, did you find something unique in that? Did God bless you? I, I hope that God blessed you by learning to see that the death of Jesus changed everything for us, that we are not to hunt for victory. We're not to live for victory, but we live from victory. So whatever struggles or challenges you have going on in your life, I want you to know that you are victorious already in Jesus. What I'm simply trying to do is to help you to see how that happens and to show you the ropes in how you can live from victory. And last week we ended it by saying, you got to drink the blood of Jesus. Now, what I want to do today is to pick up that thought and to show you how we come to the place where we can drink the blood of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn them with me to the book of John, and we're going to look at chapter 6 and verse 52. And this morning I'm reading from the English Standard Version or ESV for short. The Jews, that is code word for religious leaders in the time of Jesus, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks uh, my blood has eternal life. So, so it's critical to drink the blood of Jesus because it determines eternal life. And I'll raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. When you drink the blood of Jesus, you develop a relationship with Jesus. So this is critical to understand. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me. I actually wanted to call this sermon today, Feed on Me. But uh, I decided to go in a different direction. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. You feed on me, you will live because of me. Ah, oh. oh, I'm excited. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Carpenham. The title for today's message is called Seeing But Not Believing. Let us pray. Mighty God, teach us your will and your purpose. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. The words of Jesus when he says, you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh, have a story that we need to comprehend to make sense of what Jesus is actually trying to say. So let me show you the story before we can understand the context of these words. The day before Jesus speaks these words, he is on the seashore of Galilee. A crowd approaches him wanting to learn more about him. You see, Jesus was the latest thing in the nation. You know how it is when it's the latest thing, when it's the latest show, Squid Game, when it's the latest uh, restaurant, Subway. You, you know how that is. People flock to it. A crowd gathers to it because human beings are always excited about the latest thing, the newest thing. So Jesus was that and, and, and the crowd gathered to him because they wanted to know what he had to say. When Jesus sees this crowd approach him, he knows that they are hungering for spiritual food. 
but he can see that they have a physical need. So he would, first of all, minister to their need physically before he can minister to their need spiritually. I hope you just heard what I said right there. So Jesus turns to one of his disciples and he says to Philip, Philip, we have people here that need to be fed. How are we going to feed them? And yes, and Philip says to Jesus, well, Lord, um, we don't have much resources to feed 5,000 people. So I, I suggest we send them away. They go back home and they eat first and then let them come back. Uh, but Jesus was trying to make a point. He was trying to help his disciples to see and the crowd to see that he has enlarging power. That he has expanding power. That he has the ability to take what is small and make it big. He has the ability to multiply. He wanted them to see this ability. And so Jesus is able to take five loaves and two fishes and he makes them many loaves and many fishes and 5,000 people excluding uh, women and children are able to eat from five loaves and two fishes. I don't know if you heard what I just said right there. Jesus has the power to expand what is small and make it big. If you give Jesus your life, I want you to know that he's going to expand it into something unique and something big. If you give Jesus your meager resources, your meager investments, I want you to understand that Jesus is going to make it big. If you want Jesus to take your small family and make it into a big family, he is able to do that because he has that power and that capability. I don't know if you see that in Jesus today. We are living in a day and age when things have been constricted, when things have been made small because a pandemic has somehow squeezed us and somehow made us small. Some of us are trying to figure out how to survive. Some of us are trying to figure out how we're going to make it. Some of us are trying to figure out how tomorrow is going to look like. Because when we look at our bank account, when we look at our resources, we see them as small. Some of us are running out of money today. But let me let you know that you have a Jesus. <laughs> You have a God, you have a man who is able to expand it and enlarge it. And the question is, are you willing to bring it to him so that he can expand it and enlarge it? So Jesus is able to take five loaves and two fishes and make them many loaves and many fishes. And when people see Jesus do this, they come to an interesting conclusion in verse number 14, we read, when the people saw the sign, <laughs> when they saw the sign, can you see the signs in your life? When they saw the sign that he had done, <laughs> you need to be able to see that this is something that God has done. When they saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. Now, I want you to pause and see what the people are saying. They look at the sign that he did and they said, no, 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 no. This brother is unique. He must be the prophet that has come into the world. You must understand that when they declare this, they're not just talking about an Elijah or an Isaiah. They're talking about the prophet and the prophet was prophesied to come in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that he would come and he would change the, the, the world. He would come with the important message. And so they can now see Jesus. They can now see in him. They are now starting to believe in him because they see him as unique and special. We all need to come to that place where we see Jesus. We see him for what he really is. And when we start to see him for what he is, uh, we need to start to believe in him. We need to start moving in the direction of expressing faith in, in him. But you see, these people did something that is interesting because when they can see Jesus as this prophet, they now begin to have a purpose for Jesus. They now conclude, uh, wait a minute, this is the guy we've been looking for to be our king. We don't want Herod. 
we don't want Caesar Augustus. Uh, we want this brother to be our king. So they see him and they now believe that he can do for them what they have been meaning to do for themselves and that is to liberate themselves from the Romans and that is they can be great again as the nation of Israel. But I want you to see how Jesus reacted. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself because what they're believing in him to be is not what he knows his purpose to be. Let me drop a gem for you right here. Don't allow people see in you, don't allow what people see in you, <laughs> Change your purpose that you know to be your purpose. Don't allow what people see in you change your purpose. Don't allow people uh, affirming you, uh, people telling you and giving you compliments to change your purpose. Jesus knew that he was not to be a king. Jesus knew that them seeing him as a king was not his purpose. He wanted them to see him, yes, but not as a king. He wanted them to see him as somebody who could deliver them, not from the Romans, but someone who could deliver them from the, 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 the chains of sin. Someone who was a chain breaker, someone who was a, a way maker. He wanted them to see that, to believe in that, but they see Jesus in a totally different way. And they're trying to create a purpose for Jesus that he knows not to be his purpose. And he removed himself. He withdrew himself to the mountain. Because sometimes you got to elevate yourself when people don't see you the way they need to see you. Sometimes when you got to, you got to elevate yourself when people see you, but they don't believe in you. Some of us will need to elevate ourselves. Yes, people may not see us for who we really should be, but that's okay. Elevate yourself. Whatever your mountain is, go to that place. It's okay to sometimes withdraw. Sometimes you don't have to make an argument or defend yourself. All you have to do is to withdraw yourself. If people are not seeing you for who you really, really are, are. So the crowd comes looking for Jesus again on the next day on the seashore, but they don't find him. They understand that Jesus has now relocated himself from uh, the seashore uh, to the synagogue. And they find him at the synagogue in Carpenham and he is teaching again because Jesus always stayed on purpose. He always stayed on message. He knew what he was about. So he's in the synagogue teaching, but he is in the context of Jewish spiritual leaders. These are the scribes. These are the Sadducees. These are the Pharisees. These are the priests. These are the people that shape the narrative of the religious life of the people. They are the theologians. They're the people that everybody looks to. He is in their context. So the crowd comes looking for Jesus and he find, he, they find him in the synagogue. And I want you to notice how they pose the question to Jesus in verse 22. They said, Rabbi, how or when did you come here? Can you see how they're owning Jesus already? They're owning him. They, 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 they have a purpose for him. And they think that he should be, they, they need to know his schedule, where he's going next. They need to know it because they have a purpose for Jesus. But now notice how Jesus responds to them. He says to them, hmm. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, when Jesus talks like that, he's about to drop a bomb. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs. Now, wait a minute. They just said, uh, they just saw the signs and they're saying, this has to be our king. But Jesus is saying, uh, you saw the sign, but you didn't really see the sign. You are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, you saw the benefit of the loaves. You saw the benefit of what I did for you, but you didn't see me. Because had you seen me, you'd have believed in me. 
Notice what Jesus says. Do not do, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God has set his seal. Here is what Jesus drops on them. He's saying, look, you are working for something that perishes. You are coming to me for food, loaves and fishes. Guess what? You just digested them and you went to the bathroom and that's gone. It's perished already. It's gone. And some of us are at that place. We are hunting and we're looking for things that perish, things that do not last, things that do not, uh, that, that will not be there at the end of the day, things that make, make no difference. Some of us all we're hunting for are likes and comments on, 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 on Facebook, but those are things that perish. Some of us are busy busting our behinds, working hard, uh, being there early and leaving late. For what? Yeah, we're going to get a promotion. Yeah, we're going to get a commendation. Yeah, we're going to get a good salary. But that's not all there is to life. We need to learn and to understand that we should not work for the things that perish. So what if people like you and you're influential and people laugh at your jokes? So what? Jesus is saying we need to understand and not work for the things that perish. And Jesus is saying, look, to look, look, if you really saw what I did, you will not be coming to me asking for more bread. You'd be coming for me asking for salvation and restoration and recreation and renew. That's what you'd be asking for. So Jesus drops a bomb on them and the people can see, wait a minute, this Jesus who is a, who is a, a an expander and an enlarger, <laughs> it doesn't seem the same today. So notice what they say to Jesus. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? This is a great question because they're asking a fundamental question that you and I always need to ask. What should we do to be doing the works of God? Uh, embedded in their message is you and I should always be working for God. Now I'm talking to some people here that need to work for God. Some, some of us need to do something for God. The church, JCC, is looking for leaders in 2022. And we're going to call on some of you. And I'm hoping that you're going to respond with a yes. Because we all need to be doing the works of God. I just want to drop that right there. Before you say no, please understand. It is your responsibility and your duty to work for God. I just want to drop that right there. Anyway, that's a message for another day. <laughs> they ask him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them this. Now watch this. Right here, I want you to see um, something beautiful that blew my mind away. This is the work of God. Right? Uh, let's just pause right here. Uh, some of us are wanting to understand what we should do to work for God. I just said to you, you need to accept if we're calling you to serve JCC. Yeah, that's a part of the work of God, but there is something higher than simply serving the church or doing a role. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus is saying, your work is to believe in me. Do you know that it takes work to believe? In fact, the word used in the Greek is ernego. Ernego means to expend energy. That's where we get our word for energy from. Jesus is saying, you will need to ernego in believing in me. Do you know that it takes work to believe? Do you know that it takes effort to believe? Do you know that it takes putting your, your energies into it to believe? Some of us need to work for our belief. I believe that some of us are lazy believers. What does that look like? Some of us are so lazy that we don't expend enough energy into the word of God. Uh, we come across Revelation or Daniel and we're like, oh, these images. Oh, my goodness. It's so confusing. 
It's so difficult. Some of us only want to read the stories because it's easy to understand and it's easy to get along. But the, 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 the good thing about God is that he gave us a, a varied spiritual diet. We need Genesis. We need Exodus. But we also need to look at the apocalypse in, in, in John. We need to look at Daniel. But then after those, we also need to spring ourselves to the writings of Paul. They're confusing at times. They're difficult to understand. But you got to enable that thing and put in that energy and understand that the word of God for yourself then when you stop with, with, with Paul you also need to go and read the prophetic writings like Joel and Habakkuk and Amos and and and, 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 and then you need to go to to Job and and read his story we need to enable our faith some of us need to pray more as we are working on our faith to believe when was the last time you did fasting and prayer? When was the last time that you said, you know what, I'm going to pray all night? Some of us, all we do is to scroll all night. All we do is to watch all night. All we do is to talk all night. Perhaps we need to enable to change the dynamic and start to pray all night, read all night, and study all night, and witness all night. When was the last time that you worked for your faith, that you worked for your belief. It takes energy to believe. So Jesus says to them, believe in him whom he has sent. Uh, you see me, but you don't believe in me because you're not willing to work for it. Now, here is where it blew my mind away when I looked at this situation because they responded to Jesus when he says, you got to work for it. Notice what they said. Then... What sign do you do? You got to listen to this, my brother, my sister. Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to laugh when you read the scriptures because these brothers are just like us. Then what sign do you do that we see that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? This for me got me a little bit upset and it got me a little bit toasty, but it shows the human nature. Jesus has just performed a miracle. They have just seen it with their eyes and they have concluded, wait a minute, this is a prophet that has come down from heaven. Now, Jesus is saying, I need you to work on that. Now they're saying, you know what, God, we want you to work again so that we can believe. What are you going to do again so that we can believe? And some of us are at that place that we are asking God to work again when he has already worked. We're asking God to do again when he's already done it again. We're asking God to show us when he's already shown us again. And we, if we're at that place, my brother and my sister, we're being lazy. We're being lazy and we're not putting in the energy to our faith. God has already showed you the sign. Your friend has called you on the phone. They are openings at my office. Please uh, apply. You are going on your knees and praying, Lord, please show me if I should apply for the job. When your friend has already told you, what more sign do you need? You've already seen the, 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 the signs that, okay, this is a good time to invest. Either the market is on a bull run. So yes, uh, you don't need any more evidence to invest. Invest it now. Some of us, we do too much analysis and too much thinking. And we're asking God to show us sign after sign. We, we work God like Gideon. Show me this sign. Show me this sign. Show me this sign. But God is saying, can you operate and work on the sign that I've showed you now? Can you work on that sign? You already got a text message from that person whom you have not been talking to for so long. You, you, and you're, you're still praying, Lord, please show me a sign if I should really talk to them. When the text message came, just apply, reply to the text message and call them up and have the conversation. What's up? Sometimes God works and shows us signs after signs after signs, but we are too slow of heart. We're too hard hearted and we are too stubborn to move and to work and, and, and to go in the place of belief. And these brothers are at that place. And Jesus is, I'm sure he's flabbergasted. He says, wait a minute. How can you ask me to work more when I've already worked? When I've already put in the energy and the effort, it's time for you to put in the energy. And I came to call somebody today, start 
putting in the energy into your faith. Work on the moves of God in your life. Work on the things that God is telling you. Stop being lazy and asking for more signs. Today is the day to start to enegoing your faith. Hallelujah, somebody. But I love how Jesus responded to them. Notice what Jesus responded to them. Before I tell you what he responded to them, they even became a little bit more uh, specific about what they wanted Jesus to do. In verse 31, they tell Jesus, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Uh, so this is what they tell Jesus. Jesus, uh, I think what's going to help us is if you do something that was already done, because, you know, we, we believe in good examples. You see, in the Old Testament, as you, you know, um, a God uh, gave manna to our forefathers, our forefathers, your forefathers, our forefathers. And the manna flowed every day. And if you know that it flowed for about 40 years as they were in the wilderness. Now, what we are suggesting is if you can do something like that, meaning that you will you will expand the five loaves and the two fishes every day and give that to us. Uh, we think uh, that uh, that is what we need. Uh, that sounds like some of us that we tell God specifically what we need. We tell him exactly what we want. We tell him exactly how tall or how muscular he should be. We tell him how nice or how advanced the car should be. We tell him how great the position we want. We tell him about the opportunities that we would like. We tell him about the places that we want to live. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling God what you want, but the question should always be, is this God's will? And these brothers are telling God specifically what, or Jesus specifically, what he should do if they're going to see him to believe him. But notice what Jesus said to them. This is what I love about Jesus and his response. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses. <laughs> it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he. <laughs> For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In other words, put it differently or said in a different way. Just as saying, I'm right here. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I'm right here. We don't need manna to rain anymore. I have rained down already. If you can't accept me and see me for who I am, there is no need for you to get anything extra. Because a man convinced against his will if is of the same opinion still. They were convinced that Jesus was not anything special because he was asking them to take their faith to a higher situation. So to buy themselves time, they're saying, Lord, do another miracle, not for the purposes of believing, but for the purposes of keeping Jesus in a holding pattern. Keeping Jesus in the waiting room, uh, keeping Jesus at a stand still, and Jesus could see right through that. And some of us are keeping Jesus in the waiting room. Some of us are keeping Jesus in a holding pattern. Some of us are keeping Jesus as a standstill. We want Jesus to show us convincingly before we move in faith on him. We want Jesus to show us convincingly before we decide on him. But let me let you know, Jesus can see through you. He can see through your mind. He knows what you are about. So he will never allow you to keep him in a holding pattern. He will never allow you to keep him in a waiting room. He'll never allow you to keep him standing still. He will read right through you and he'll tell you the truth. He will tell you, look, I'm right here. If you're not going to move on me right here, right now, it's cool. But I ain't going to do nothing extra to pander to you or to kowtow to you. I'm Jesus. I'm God. And I need you to respond uh, now, now again, I need you to, to know that Jesus is saying all of this in the context of the synagogue 
And these words have been directed to the crowd. But at this point, the Jews, uh, the scribes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the priests, they get in involved in the action and, and they speak. And I want you to see how they responded to Jesus. So the Jews grumbled about him. The Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus? <laughs> is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? It's loaded right here. It's loaded. You see, from the seaside to the synagogue, there is a change. I hope you can observe it. You see, on the seaside, Jesus performs a miracle. They love it and they want to make him a king. They, 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 they see him. They're believing in him. It's a little bit twisted because they want to make him king. They don't see him as savior yet. But at least they're following him. But now when they allow the Jews, the people that they believe in, the people they look to for spiritual guidance, the theologians of their day, they see that the theologians of their day have flipped the whole situation around and they are now seeing Jesus not as the special person who can lead them, they are seeing Jesus like the son of Joseph. They say, this Jesus, isn't he the son of Joseph? We know his father. We know his mother. Do you know how Jesus was born? This is what is embedded in this. He was born in a funny way. We don't even know if he, <laughs> if he is a legit son. So from somebody who is seen on the, on the seashore as a deliverer, as somebody who can expand, he's now limited and relegated and dropped to a mere man position. He is the son of Joseph. What they're really saying is, don't believe in him. He's, he's nothing. He cannot do anything for us. And what amazed me is that they're grumbling at their solution for their sin. What amazed me is that spiritual people are grumbling at a solution for them. They are grumbling at their blessing. Isn't it so true? Like some of us, we grumble at the blessings of God. We grumble at the blessings of God. Uh, some of us grumble at the traffic, forgetting that we have a blessing to be in a car when somebody could die for the same car. Yet we grumble and we blow the horn, uh, creating noise pollution in the city because we are upset. Yet, had we thought ahead of time, we could have left early and made it to our appointment early and on time without having to grumble uh, along the streets and the paths. Some of us, we grumble at our own families. We grumble at our parents, yet somebody doesn't have parents. Some of us, we grumble at our own children, forgetting that somebody doesn't have children. Somebody is dreaming to have children. Some of us, we grumble at our own families, especially when it's time to get together as a family, Yet somebody is dreaming and dying to get together with their own families. Some of us, we grumble at our own church. We, we complain about what's not happening or what's going on. Uh, we complain and, and instead of appreciating the blessing that we have a church family and we have a place to go, yet we grumble. Some of us grumble at all, all, all the job that we have, forgetting that that's the blessing that God has given us to be able to make ends meet. Some of us will grumble where we live at. We grumble over our own house. We grumble over the things in our, in, in, in that, that are going on, forgetting that the very things that we have are the blessings that we have from God. Yet we grumble about them. 
And these religious leaders are grumbling at Jesus. And you know why they're grumbling? They're grumbling because he has said something that is uncomfortable for them. They don't like it. And that's where many of us grumble because we're uncomfortable. We don't like the situation in which we're in. But if you can only move from not from being uncomfortable, because when you are in the discomfort zone, God is trying to grow you. Have you ever thought it like that? That when things are uncomfortable, when you don't like things, when things don't look right, when things don't feel right, that is God's message to you. It's time to grow. (laughs) It's time for you to level up. And that's what Jesus is trying to let them know. Do not be stuck on to level up. I want you to see me in a different light. Do not be stuck on the Jewish leaders, on their teachings. I want you to level up. And somebody today needs to level up. Somebody today needs to grow up. You need to look at Jesus in a different way. And some of us are at the place where we are at the seaside. We can see Jesus and we're like, man, oh man, this Jesus is something special. But when we listen to his word, we're saying, man, Jesus can change my life. Some of us are at that place, but some of us, we have moved onto the synagogue and we've been listening to what our spiritual influences are telling us. We've been listening to arguments against Jesus and now our convention, our convictions are no longer what they are supposed to be. Let me make you uncomfortable for, 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 for a bit because that is my job to make you uncomfortable. Don't hate me. I'm just a messenger. You know what I'm saying? You see, some of us, we're convinced that it's cool. It's cool to pray and talk to God and lift our, our eyes to God. But because our prayers haven't been answered the way we wanted to be answered, We're no longer convinced about God. And we're now starting to think, can God really answer prayer? Can God really answer prayer? Can he really connect to me? Can he really change my situation? And now we are doubting the very God that we use to believe in. And some of us, because we have faced difficulties, whether it be in the uh, family circle, whether it be in the work circle, whether it be in the friendship circle, whether it be in the financial circle, we are no longer as committed to God as we once were. We're no longer committed to Him as it was before. I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody today who has moved from the seaside to the synagogue. I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody today whose convictions are no longer the same because circumstances have changed. God doesn't look the same way to you. God is asking or demanding something different from you. He wants more commitment from from you. He wants more from you. And because of that, you're no longer at that place. Some of you have been spoken to by people at home and they've told you, you know what? You, You don't need to be so committed to the church thing. You don't need to give so much. Therefore, because you've heard that message, you're no longer seeing Jesus, the way you need to see him, and all you see him is uh, like these brothers. They see him as the son of Joseph. As the son of Joseph. Uh, Allow me to uh, bring this sermon now and connect it to our theme, uh, living from victory. You see, if you're going to live a life from victory, a life of victory, you will need to embrace the way Jesus reveals himself to you. You need to embrace the way Jesus reveals himself to you. The way you see Jesus is the way you need to appreciate and accept him. Because when you do not appreciate and accept him, you are living at a place of defeat. Let me make it clear. And make it more plain for you. The other day I was invited to go to Gebeka Arena. Now, the city of Jakarta has shown me and revealed to me that if you want to make to, to make it to any appointment on time, you need to leave early. That's what I have known as I have been in Jakarta for the last four years now. <laughs> it's been four years already. <laughs> Lord, praise your name. But I decided for some reason, to trust my own perspective. So I ordered my grab bike 
20 minutes before my appointment. And guess what? I arrived there 40 minutes later. But had I followed the revelation, had I followed what I had seen in Jakarta, and that is you need to live on time, I would have been victorious in my quest to make it on time to Gebeka Arena. But somehow I decided to change up the situation to fit my own, my own liking at the moment. And therefore, instead of being victorious, I was defeated. You and I need to look at Jesus the same way. There is a reason why he is revealing himself, himself to them as the bread that came down from heaven. Because he's trying to show them, look, I am the essential nutrient that you need in order for you to survive. And if I can be like this bread in your life and you appreciate me in your life, then I can sustain you. This is the logic Jesus is dropping on them. But instead of seeing Jesus as someone who can sustain them, they are saying, oh, this is the son of Joseph. This is the son of Joseph. But the thing is, what can the son of Joseph do for them? Nothing. <laughs> he can do nothing for them because he is just on the same level as them. But if they can see him as the bread that came down from heaven, then he has a heavenly solution for their earthly problem. This is what Jesus is trying to point at. Can I bring it a little bit closer to you? You see, we need to be able to see Jesus in every facet if we're going to have the victory and have the solution that we need for our specific problems in our lives. You see, there is a reason why Jesus is presented to us in 4D. We see him in Matthew. We see him in Mark. We see him in Luke. We see him in John. Matthew tells us he is the king. Mark tells us he is the son of God. Luke tells us he is the son of man. And John tells us he is God. When I see a king in Matthew, I know that he is the one who is in charge of everything in this world. And when I see the authoritarian people or the authoritarian leaders in this world, I know that they are nothing in comparison to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in, in Jesus. But seeing Jesus as King doesn't actually save me. Because I need the Son of God to come into my life and change my situation. Because He has the power to change things immediately. When I see myself struggling to overcome uh, temptation, when I see myself struggling to overcome gossip, when I see myself struggling to overcome my urges in my body, when I see myself struggling to overcome a, a, a temper, when I see myself struggling to overcome uh, anger, when I see myself struggling to overcome overeating, I need the Son of God to enter my life to show me that he has power to elevate me higher. <laughs> he has power to elevate me higher. But then when I see that power to elevate me higher, I look at myself and I say, Lord, I am but a man. Lord, I am low. I cannot come up higher. Then Jesus tells me through Luke, I am the son of man. I have been tempted in no point just like you, yet I overcame. So the image of the Son of Man helps me to know that though he is high, yet he is low. Hallelujah, somebody. And I need you to know that you need to be able to see Jesus, though high, he is also low. He knows how to be up there. He knows how to be prim and proper, but he also knows how to, he knows how to get dirty and he knows how to get deep in your struggle and in your situation and in your mess. When you're crying and sad and sappy, he doesn't say, oh, why are you so sad and, and sappy? You need to man up and, and woman up. No, Jesus knows how to come down to your level and say, you know what? I'm right there with you. I understand it. So I need that image of Jesus because in my sad and sappy days when I'm looking for that victory I say well Lord you also know what it means to be right here but that's not all when I go to John I'm now convinced that this is God 
He is the word that was in the beginning and he is God. And so when I see this image of Jesus, <laughs> when I see it like this, then I'm able to live a life of victory. And you need to be comfortable with this image of Jesus. Whatever revelations you have of Jesus, as the revelations that you need to have the victory in your life. Perhaps some of you this year, you have seen Jesus as the one who is, to, who is able to provide. That's the revelation you need to give you victory when you look at your bank account and you, you see that it is low. You feel me? Some of you have seen Jesus as a healer after you suffered through the virus entering your body. Now you know it's not the medicines, it's not the vitamins, it's not the doctors, but it is, it is Jesus. And now when another disease comes, you are not going to be afraid and scared, but you're going to be able to say, you know what, hey, Jesus is able to heal me. It doesn't make you silly or stupid, not trusting the, the, the medical advice, but you put the medical advice in its proper place because you realize and you understand that Jesus is, is a healer. What has Jesus revealed himself to you? Whatever he has revealed himself to you is what you need to have the victory that you have in your life. And when you have seen that, you need to believe that. When you have seen that, you need to trust that. When you have seen that, you need to put energy into that so that you can have your belief on point. You need to be able to see and to believe. But if you are only seeing and not believing, Jesus can not help you. Now, I have said all of that to bring us back to our key text and our passage when Jesus says, you got to drink me. You got to drink me and drink my blood and eat my flesh. Let's look at this uh, for a moment and, and, and let's go at it. What Jesus is trying to say and has said has made them uncomfortable because it's not what they're used to. But we know that Jesus often brings us in, into the discomfort zone to help us to grow. And he is simply saying this to them because they need to see this side of him if he is to give them the victory that they need at this particular moment. Because at this particular moment, the people are trusting institutions. They are trusting the temple. They are trusting their sacrifices. But Jesus is saying that will not give you life or victory. So what Jesus has to do is to use the metaphor of eating and drinking to show them how he can help them. But he must do it in a way that is going to jar them. It's going to shake them up. It's going to make them offended. And that's okay. It's okay to be offended. It's okay to be, to be shaken up if it is going to make us to grow. And that is why Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He says, I need you to see me as something essential to you. I need you to see me as the the spiritual nutrition that you need because obviously Jesus is not talking literally. Jesus is talking figuratively. Now, what does it actually mean to eat his blood and to, I mean, to drink his blood and to eat his flesh? It simply means this. It, it means to appropriate the words of Jesus into your life. You right now, as you're listening to me preach this word, you are actually drinking and eating this word. And by doing that, it is strengthening your faith and encouraging you. That is the same way that we're able to drink the blood of Jesus and to eat his flesh. When we take his word and put it into our system, but what is important is we must believe it. We must not only hear it, we must not only understand it, we must not only 
uh, listen to it, but we must believe in it. And when we believe in it, then we are actually eating it and we are now connecting with Jesus in real life. And this is the beauty of the situation. This is the beauty of the word of God. This is the beauty of the, the, the spiritual connection. You and I do not need to travel to America. You and I do not need to travel to Africa. You and I do not need to listen to another preacher. We can simply take the word of God for ourselves, listen to it, study it. And by doing that, guess what? We are receiving Jesus into our spirit. We're receiving Jesus into our lives. We're receiving Jesus into our experience. And Jesus is right there walking with us, guiding us, leading us. And when we do that, we're going to live a life of victory. Notice what Jesus says. For my flesh is a true food. My, my flesh is true food and my blood is to drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Unfortunately, many of us, like the Jews, we dispute what Jesus says. We, we dispute it. When Jesus says, I will, I will forgive of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, we dispute that. We, 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 we say, Lord, my sins are so bad, you, you cannot like, really forgive me. Like, do you know what I've done? When we do that, we are seeing and I believe it. And we're failing to drink the blood of Jesus. When the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we worry. And then we seek marriage before his righteousness. We seek a job before his righteousness. We seek friendship before his righteousness. We are not drinking his blood. We are seeing it, but not believing in him. It's a crucial, it's, 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 it's essential that you, you move your life beyond seeing the word, hearing the word, to believing the word. And when you do that, you allow Jesus to enter your very existence. Uh, let me just check with you. What is your attitude towards what I've said to you so far? Uh, perhaps you're like, ah, Pastor, I don't really understand you. I don't get it. That's cool. So what do you need to do? You need to work on that so that you can believe it. And when you work on it, you come to the place of conviction and understanding. You're drinking the blood of Jesus. Are you feeling what I'm saying? If you don't understand, you can even come to me, Pastor. You, you said this in the sermon. I didn't get it. Can you break it down for me so that I can understand it? Can I, can I, can you, can we have a conversation so that we can really get deep in it? As I told you, it takes work to believe. It takes work to, to understand. It takes work. It takes work. You will need to do work. And you and I need to start working. You know what I'm saying? We need to start working. We need to start putting in the effort, the energy, and making sure that we have our spiritual nutrition on point. Every day you're drinking, every day you're eating. And when you do that, you're seeing Jesus and believing in Jesus. So I came to call you today to see Jesus and to believe. To drink his blood and to eat his flesh. And by ingesting the word of God. I want you to make a commitment today that each and every day you are going to drink the blood of Jesus and eat his flesh. Each and every day you're going to make it a point to study the word of God, to get deep in the word of God and allow it to enter your experience. And whenever you have challenges and troubles in understanding the word of God, it doesn't make sense to you. I want you to make the commitment that you're going to do all it takes in your power to understand it. You're going to do all in your power to put in the energy and the effort that is necessary for you to be able to see and believe in Jesus. 
Every head is bowed. Every set of eyes is closed as we pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Uh, we are humbled. We are inspired. And we would like you to take us to the next experience of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey there. Did that word touch you? Did it speak to your heart? Do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? I want you to know that today is the day you can do that. Do not delay. Do not wait any longer. The number on the screen, JCC hotline number is where you can connect with us. Drop us a message and we'll be more than happy to reach out to you. We want you to have a life changing experience. And we know that the only place and the only person who can do that for you is Jesus Christ. So may God bless you and strengthen you. And once again, I want to talk to anybody who has been impressed by God to give something to contribute to this ministry, to connect with us and to help us to do our mission to the fullest of our ability. And you can also give at the account on the screen. May God bless you and take care of you. And I'm gonna see you real soon. Peace.